Last week I wrote, filmed and partway edited a video telling the story of this, the Matra Rancho. But on Sunday evening, by sheer coincidence, a much bigger YouTube channel, Hubnut, beat me to it and posted a video saying all the things I was going to. If you're watching this, it's almost certainly because you already watched that, because that's how YouTube works. So I've binned off my original film so you don't get bored or think I'm just a copycat, and here's six and a half things he didn't say. But first, a little bit of context. Even if you don't own some sort of sport utility vehicle, then the chances are that half your neighbours do. In which case, you should thank the car in this video, which is of course the Matra Rancho, which is the daddy of all the urban soft roader SUV crossovers that have now come to dominate the roads. When the Rancho was launched in 1977, there was nothing quite like it. The Range Rover and American cars like the Jeep Wagoneer and AMC Eagle do predate it and had high riding, chunky off roader looks, of course, and varying degrees of capability to go with it. But they still weren't as out there as the Rancho. As Ian at Hubnut pointed out, the Rancho was based on the Simca 1100, with this huge glassy rear superstructure, the black plastic protective body kit, a nudge bar, and all these auxiliary lights. The Simca 1100 was a roughly golf-sized French family hatchback that's now almost extinct and largely forgotten by most people, but is in fact a historically interesting car in its own right. Launched in 1967, the Simca 1100 was one of the early pioneers of the front-wheel drive hatchback format, with a transverse engine and end-on gearbox that later became more or less ubiquitous. What Ian didn't say is that the 84bhp Ti version of the Simca 1100 has a pretty solid claim to being the very first hot hatch, predating the Golf GTI and Renault 5 Alpine, or Gordini here in the UK, by a couple of years. The TI version of the Alpha Sud came out a few months earlier, but it wasn't actually a hatchback until a lot later, if we're going to be pedantic. Which, of course, we are. The Simca 1100 spawned a whole litter of commercial variants, as French cars were particularly prone to doing, and the Rancho is based on a strengthened version of either the pickup or the VF2 box van version, depending on who you ask. Or maybe they're the same. Whatever. You might think that the Rancho was the ultimate stretch of the Simca 1100 platform, but you'd be wrong. Not only did it carry on as the underpinnings of the Chrysler or Talbot Horizon that gradually replaced the 1100, but also the larger Alpine and Solara. And it didn't stop there, because the Horizon made the leap across the Atlantic as well to become the Plymouth Horizon and Dodge Omni, with a very similar looking body, but different powertrain and suspension. And the Dodge Omni and Plymouth Horizon battled on until 1990, still using the underpinnings from the Simca 1100 from 1967. But the exotic cousins story gets weirder than that. So what connects racing and sports car legends Carol Shelby and Alejandro de Tommaso to the Matra Rancho? Well, again, it's that Simca 1100 platform. Because Chrysler US spun off a more sporty looking version, sort of, called the Dodge Charger. Not the one that the Deuce of Hazard rolled around in, but this. Carol Shelby got involved in turbocharging it, as well as making various other modifications, as the Shelby Charger. While De Tommaso, who was briefly an F1 driver, but is more famous for such beasts as the Pantera and Mangusta, merely lent his name to a rather ludicrously badged up special edition, which in standard form put out a measly 70 brake horsepower, which was nine less than the Rancho. And people complain about the Rancho being all hat and no cattle. Because Hubnut covered the main highlights of the Rancho story, I'm having to dig pretty deep to find things that are interesting and you don't already know. And here's a doozer. Chrysler Europe was so excited about the new Rancho that in 1977 they released a 7-inch single to go with it. Now, sadly, I can't play you the original song because I'd get banned for a copyright strike. But here's a cover version that I made, which is frankly not a great deal worse. And I can show you the lyrics courtesy of a fabulous French website called Bide Musique. 
no, not Bide Music, Bide Music. I'll put a link to that site in the description because you can hear the original there. Pure gold, I'm sure you'll agree. And a total earworm as well. I've ruined my life finding this song uh, and now I've ruined yours. Sorry about that. Nowadays, people often look down on the rancho for being not so much camel trophy as Marlboro Light. It's true that the French advertising did show the rancho in various rather optimistic off-road situations, given its lack of four-wheel drive, but in the UK at least, it was never really promoted as anything other than urban chic. This early magazine advert showed it parked outside Harrods, for example, while this 1982 range brochure puts it in the slightly more prosaic environment of an antique shop in Bedford. They did use the word tough a lot, though. There's some justification for it. It does have a skid plate to protect the sump, and of course it's got that nudge bar and all-round chunky black body protection. The cladding is hard and rigid plastic rather than rubber, so it isn't deformable in an impact, like a Porsche 928 or something, which came out about the same time. But it's really thick for shrugging off attacks from supermarket trolleys or Death Wish pheasants and vaped up children on electric scooters. Although we didn't have those back then. In any event, the rancho's lack of serious off-roading ability wasn't really an issue back then, because nobody expected otherwise, any more than anyone today moans that their Nissan Qashqai bogged down in the Darien Gap, or calls the Porsche Macan a Porsche Macant. Off-roading as a hobby hadn't even been invented. Ah, they were glorious days, those late 70s, apart from the terrible hair and everyone being a racist. For a lark, though, Mel Nichols at Car Magazine took a rancho and a Range Rover away on a dirty weekend together in the summer of 1978. Car never expected it to match up to the Range Rover, they were just curious and amused to see how much assault course it would do before it gave up. The answer, unsurprisingly, was not terribly much, although the rancho's reasonable 26cm ground clearance meant it did do okay on rough tracks and fields. And honestly, that's just fine, because buyers really just wanted the cool looks and abundant practicality for more regular middle-class goings-on like buying a chest of drawers. Performance from the Rancho's 1442cc version of the Simca Poissy engine, which was shared with the Chrysler Alpine, Solara and Horizon, as well as Martra's quirky three-seater Bagheera sports car, was quite similar to the bigger and much heavier Range Rover, with its 3.5-litre V8. Noise levels were similar too at a motorway cruise. The Simca engine isn't the most refined unit ever, but then the Range Rover back in those days had epic amounts of transfer box rumble until they sorted that out sometime in the late 1980s. The Rancho was quite expensive in the UK, especially early on. It's always tricky to compare prices in the late 1970s and early 80s because inflation was so high, over 20% at times, and that meant a car could go from being much cheaper than its peers to much more expensive, depending on whether it had had this month's price hike yet. The Rancho was priced against some much bigger engined alternatives, although not necessarily faster, and it was twice the price of the top-line Simca 1100. But if you compare it against other six or seven seaters, it starts to make a bit more sense, and it was a lot easier to park than most of those. The Rancho was two-thirds the price of a Range Rover in 1978, but it became rather better value into the 1980s, as the value of sterling improved significantly against the French franc. And by the summer of 1982, a Rancho was less than half the price of the two-door Range Rover, which makes a lot more sense, and so the Rancho went from being an exotic Knightsbridge rarity to a relatively common sight. And of course, the biggest saving of all was that the Rancho was literally miles ahead in fuel economy, travelling nearly twice as far as a Range Rover for every gallon of four-star. The Rancho's styling is attributed to Matra designer Antonis Volanis, who also gave us the sporty Big Era and Morena, and went on to create this, the original Renault Espace. History doesn't recall who came up with the name, but the word rancho is apparently South American Spanish for a type of simple, austere rural dwelling. In other words, it's a shed. I'd never call it a shed in English, though, especially not to its face. 
With a low volume maker like Matra, what could have been a part bit mongrel was actually made up of specific Rancho components. Apart from the front half being a Simca, obviously. Sometimes people ask me what those rear lights are from. And the answer is, they're from a Rancho. Those lights, the roof rack, the folding seats, all the windows from the B-post back, and even the wheels were unique to the Rancho. Which makes life fun getting parts if you happen to own one. Which brings me on to the half a thing that Ian didn't say. Why is it a half? Well, it's because I can say it, but he couldn't. And it's that I do actually own one of the last surviving UK ranchos. It's not the shiny red one in Ian's video, though, or in Furious Matt's video from a while back as well. That one belongs to Clive Nelson from the Matro Enthusiasts Club. Mine is B342NRW, the bronze one you see here. But it's not shiny, and it's been off the road since 1996. And I don't mean that in the green laning sense. The action shots you've been watching are all CGI fakery that I've created. If you want to see just how rusty it is in real life, then you'll have to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications, because that's a whole other video for next time. Bye for now.